Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now you may have seen or read a few Ryzen 8600 and 8700G reviews over the last week or so, and while I'll be bringing you my thoughts on both at some point, I wanted to focus on the lesser known addition to the new 8000 series APUs. This is the Ryzen 5 8500G. It has 6 cores, 12 threads and RDNA 3 based Radeon 740M graphics. Here in the UK it retails for £170.50 pounds cheaper than the 8600G and a whopping £140 less than the flagship 8700G. The 8500G consists of two Zen 4 cores and four more power efficient Zen 4C cores and during my testing today I found that it consumed less than 50 watts of power most of the time, whether in use with the onboard graphics or when paired with a discrete GPU. In the box we have the processor itself along with a Wraith Stealth cooler which does a perfectly adequate job with this 65 watt chip. For today's tests I paired it with a Gigabyte B650 MDS3H motherboard and 16 gigs of 6000 MHz dual channel DDR5 RAM. An early typo on the AMD site convinced some that this CPU only ran single channel memory but that has since been corrected and is of course not the case. First things first, let's talk about the 740M performance. The 740M has 4 compute units and will clock up to 20 2800 megahertz. I tested a handful of games today, the first of which is Grand Theft Auto 5. I jumped in at 1080p and chose the normal settings, which in GTA is basically the lowest options. There was no frame scaling involved and the detail sliders remained at halfway. FXAA was also enabled. We were seeing over 90 FPS here, which was a very surprising result, and the percentile lows even held up pretty well too. I'm looking forward to see how the 8600G and 8700G compare at some point, but based on these results, I'm expecting good things. Next up we have Cyberpunk 2077. This benefits from FSR 2.1 which came in very handy here. I stuck with 1080p as the base resolution, settled the graphics options to their respective lowest and went with the performance FSR mode. We were getting over 50 FPS here on average which again was a decent result in my opinion, though this time our percentile lows did suffer a little bit but the onboard graphics weren't entirely to blame. I drove towards a particularly processor intensive part of Night City and here we saw CPU utilisation jump up to over 90%. Even though the graphics are going to be the limitation, areas like this can still affect the consistency of the game. That said, over 50 FPS with no discrete GPU is very impressive in my opinion, considering that this is the more affordable chip in the 8000 series lineup. A graphics card less PC build is often better suited to run competitive online titles like CS2. At 1080p with the lowest settings we were averaging 119 FPS. There were no major hiccups or stutters as reflected in the surprisingly solid percentile figures. Hitting over 120 FPS should be easy enough by enabling FSR or by dropping the native res a little bit. As you can see my CS2 gameplay was as brilliant as ever, but I did manage to wipe out a couple of enemies here, so that was something. I wasn't expecting much from Kingdom Come Deliverance given how intensive it can be with higher end systems. That said, at 1080p with the low preset, the 8500G and 740M managed to achieve well over 40fps. Not only that, but the experience was surprisingly smooth, save for a few small performance drops. This is to be expected really, but even running around Ratai and causing chaos amongst its residents didn't do too much to hinder the performance numbers. Now I'm pretty sure memory plays a big part and if you were to use slower speed DDR5 say 5200 MHz then performance across all of today's tested games would likely vary quite a bit. Also, avoid using a single stick of RAM completely, as that will be detrimental. On to Fortnite now, and this does have a performance mode which lowers the graphics beyond low settings for weaker PCs, but I didn't feel the need to use it here so I stuck with the standard low preset, enabled FXAA, and maintained 100% scaling for an average of 90fps. Again the percentile lows also represented a surprising level of consistency, and my half hour Fortnite gameplay session felt very pleasant to play. Notice how the 8500G is still only consuming around 50 watts of power, which I feel is quite impressive given the performance we get back. If you want a casual gaming PC on the latest platform then this isn't a bad choice, but this is where we have to talk about the not so good part. The 8500G is a Phoenix 2. 
CPU. And unlike the Phoenix One based 8600 and 8700G, it has fewer PCIe lanes. In fact, adding a discrete graphics card to the PCIe slot on a motherboard will mean that said card runs in PCIe X4 mode, instead of X8 mode like with the more expensive chips. This is actually stated on my motherboard spec sheet, and I confirmed it in GPU-Z after installing my 4070 Super. This is why the 8500G makes the most sense as part of an integrated graphics only build, and anyone looking for a cheaper AM5 setup with a discrete card should consider the 7500F or 7600 instead. That's not to say that a PCIe 4.0 card running in X4 mode will completely decimate performance though, because actually it wasn't as bad as I was anticipating. So let's run a few comparisons between the 8500G and 7500F in pairing with my discrete 4070S. Now for a little bit of context here, here are some processor intensive benchmarks that highlight the differences between the 8500G and 7500F. We have the Cinebench R23 scores and the DaVinci render scores. We can see that the 7500F is the more powerful chip anyway, but the 8500G is no slouch, that's for sure. First up then we have Cyberpunk 2077 with the high preset. The 8500G hit 146 FPS average with a 1% low of 84 and a 0.1% low of 70. The 7500F hit 160 FPS on average with an increased 1% low of 108, although our 0.1% figure wasn't that much different. For Crisis Remastered, I also ran the in-game benchmark, which I did for all of these games, and the 8500G scored 82 FPS with 43 and 38 respectively as those percentile numbers. It wasn't too different with the 7500F, which hit 86 FPS with a 1% low of 44 and a 0.1% low of 38. Bear in mind that the card is running in full PCIe X16 4.0 mode with the 7500F. CPU. The processors are definitely the limitations here though. With the Red Dead Redemption 2 in-game benchmark, the 8500G produced 124 FPS with the 4070S, a 1% low of 91 and a 0.1% low of 84. The results were better with the 7500F with 143 FPS, a 1% low of 106 and a 0.1% low of 88. Still not that much difference at the 0.1% figure, but there is a noticeable performance uplift with the 7000 series chip. Finally then we have GTA 5 134 for the 7500F, 119 for the 8500G. Again the percentile lows were quite similar but this time the 8500G pulled ahead with 72 frames per second as opposed to 66 but the 1% figure was better with the 7500F so there we are. As I said before though, the 8500G is better suited to a PC build that doesn't have a graphics card. And one that you don't intend to add a graphics card to. But if you do, you're still going to get solid performance with a mid-range or higher-end card. Though I can't imagine you'd add a high-end card anyway. But overall, if you want the latest platform, a low-power machine, and one that can actually play games without the need for a discrete GPU, the 8500G is okay. If you plan on adding a discrete card later, either get a 7500F instead, spend more on the 7600, or get the Ryzen 8600G for about £50 more, which may definitely be worth it considering we get PCIe X8 instead. But let me know your thoughts down below. As always, thank you for watching. This has been my 8500G review, and I'll see you all in the next one.